The 90s, aka the golden age of hip-hop and R&B, produced insane talents that some may still recognize today, many going on to have long-lasting careers, while others have come and gone like the wind. Numbers are important, but what's even more important is how you leave your mark on the industry. And Devante, Dalvin, Casey and Jojo have not only kept their foot on our necks, they've completely dominated the R&B scene for years and changed the state of music as we know it. Nicknamed the bad boys of R&B, their mysterious attitudes, rebellious nature and sensual voices combined with their fake shy-like innocence are what differentiates these men from the rest. From rolling with death row and being mentored by the infamous Sugar Knight, relationship scandals with Madonna, Mary J. Blige, run-ins with the law and a whole lot of in-between. They were able to capture the attention from artists like Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and were decades ahead of their time. Grab your snacks and get ready to dive into why folks till this day are still honoring the name Jodeci. Long before Jodeci became Jodeci, they were four regular guys from the middle-class city of Charlotte, North Carolina. Coincidentally enough, they were all raised in extremely religious Christian homes and had been exposed to singing early on in their lives. Cedric Haley, a aka KCI and Joel Haley, aka Jojo, already had a taste of local fame when they created their own quartet-styled gospel group in the 80s with the help of their parents Anita and Cliff Haley, who were also known gospel singers. The group was known as Little Cedric and the Haley Singers and released songs such as Jesus Saves, Be Born Again and Have Faith. KCI's distinct voice garnered him local attention and people even went as far as to compare him to a young Michael Jackson. On the other side of town were Donald and Dalvin DeGreat, who later on would go by the names Devante Swing and Mr. Dalvin. Similar to the Haley brothers, the DeGreats had musical ties and also came from a long lineage of gospel singers. They were in church seven days a week and were more on the contemporary side. They too would perform and tour around the country, most often with their father Don DeGreat with his group the Don DeGreat Delegation. The DeGreats and the Haley's knew of each other due to both sets of brothers making waves around their city, but never actually met. That is, until one day, a member of a gospel girl group called Unity was dating Casey at the time and convinced the DeGreats to meet up with her then boyfriend. The brothers agreed and one day they all pulled up to the Haley studio. Casey seemed to have had the wrong impression because not too long after the meetup, Casey pulled out a gun on Dalvin because he was convinced Dalvin was talking to his girl. The two continued to go back and forth in the hallway, Casey accusing and Dalvin pleading his innocence. Meanwhile, in the other room, Devante and Jojo were chatting it up, getting to know each other and had already begun working on music. KCI would later go back to working with his gospel group and Dalvin did his own thing for a while. As time passed, Jojo and Devante's relationship would grow closer and closer, while Devante's relationship with his parents would decline due to his defiance and he eventually moved in with the Haley's. At only 16, Devante travel to Minneapolis in order to hopefully get the opportunity to audition for Prince at Paisley Park. He discloses more details in a throwback 1995 interview with Vibe magazine, stating, When I was 16, I ran away from home and went to Minneapolis to get a job with Prince. KCI and Jojo and them was like, if you make it with Prince, don't forget about us. When I got to Minneapolis, I hooked up with two white girls who had this gold Mustang that their father let me drive. I was up at Paisley Park every day begging for a job, asking people to listen to my tape. The receptionist kept saying she couldn't help me. I wasn't going to leave until they put me on. Needless to say they didn't put him on and he headed back to Carolina to sharpen up his producing and songwriting skills. Devante came up with the idea to create a group with just Jojo, but decided to add Casey and Delvin after they practically begged him. Devante was determined and really strived to get his new formed group noticed and he did everything he could to do so. He was the group's producer and main songwriter and set out to write a demo tape which included 29 songs to present to label executives over at Uptown Records in New York. Little did he know this tape Tape would forever change their lives. But before we dive into the nitty gritty, let's take a step back. Let me set the tone for y'all. The year is 
1989. Devante hits up his younger brother Delvin and asks if he's down to join them on their trip to New York since at this point. Delvin is kinda in the group, but not really, cause you know, brothers. To which Delvin eagerly agreed and not long after, the group is on the road. With only $300 in their pockets and no place to stay, the boys are determined to get signed but run into a little problem. They have no idea where they're going. With the help of a yellow pages phone book, they find the location in Brooklyn. Upon arriving, they run into yet another problem. They don't exactly have an appointment. They plead with their uptown receptionist to allow them entry and to their surprise, she lets them in. They came across Uptown employee Kurt Woodley, who had agreed to listen to their tape, but in mid-session ended up falling asleep. He claimed the tape was boring, so the boys decided to do what any desperate teens trying to get signed to a huge label would do. They sang a cappella. Intrigued by the group's impromptu performance, Uptown artist G Wiz from Heavy D and the boys knocked on the door, asked, who is that singing? And went on to get Heavy D, who then went and got Andre Harrell, the CEO. The group would sing a few songs Devante had written back in Carolina for his then girlfriend Monica. Come and talk to me and I'm still waiting to name a few. This impressed Andre and the next thing they knew they were out to dinner discussing a contract. Jodeci had officially been signed to Uptown Records. Sean Combs before he became P Diddy was a wee little intern at this point in his career and was given the task to develop Uptown's new up and coming act. They wanted to counteract the refined styles prominent in R&B displayed by groups such as New Edition. <laughs> and boys to men. Oh, the help of Dalvin and Diddy's stylist girlfriend Misa Hylton. Misa advised Sean, aka Diddy, to incorporate hip hop fashion such as baseball caps, jerseys, jewelry, sunglasses and Timberland boots. To hide in their bad boy aesthetic, Diddy also suggested they be discreet in interviews and posed with their backs to the cameras, a stint he borrowed from the group Guy. Jodeci's debut album Forever My Lady was released on May 28th in 1991 and will be labelled as the album that reinvigorated R&B. The Productive energy and overall production of the body of work was praised by critics, some calling the album sophisticated beyond the band members' years. It features the hits Forever My Lady, Stay and Come and Talk to Me with musical guidance from Al B. Shaw. Yes, Quincy's daddy. Diddy was determined to make Jodeci successful and was on a mission to outdo New Jack Swing pioneer Teddy Riley who pioneered setting New Jack Swing to rap style shuffled beats. This urged Diddy to replace the drums and melodies from one of the album's ballad, Come and Talk to Me, with a sample from EPMD's You're a Customer. Set to the beat of Houdini's Five Seconds of Funk. He quickly realized that adding hip hop samples to traditional R&B songs would garner attention from fans of both genres, which would result into higher charting on Billboard charts. In conclusion, a new formula known as the remix was born. In its first week, Forever My Lady had debuted at number one on the top R&B album chart and peaked at number 18 on the US Billboard 200. Angel, come on and let us squeeze in. With the hit Come and Talk to Me debuting in the top 20. The album was soon certified multi platinum by the RIAA. Jodeci had taken the music scene by storm. Jodeci. Dalvin would describe the group as a black Guns N' Roses due to his and Devante's ability to play multiple instruments combined with their tattoos, party lifestyles and lack of choreo. Jodeci were at the starting peak of their careers and it was around this time that 22 year old Devante had a plan of starting his own movement within a movement. With his ear for musical talent, he began recruiting talent from all over the country. Songwriters, producers, singers, engineers, you name it. He had formed several groups, one of the first being the group Sister, which featured a young Miss Elliot. Through this process, he also discovered a young Genuine, Timberland, Stevie J, Static Major and more. With so much talent under his belt, they'd create a collective stint under Elektra Records that never came to fruition. Swing Mob, also commonly known as The Basement Crew. They all lived together in a complex across the street from the basement studio which Devante had rented out for his artists. 
It was something like a musical boot camp. Swing mob alumni Daryl Pearson recalls, we would go to sleep, wake up constantly, all day long. It was just music. We would clown around, but we were serious about what we did musically. We worked like crazy. Stevie J recalls a time where he says Devante's bodyguard and cousin were going around slapping folks the F up, but said Devante knew not to try that with him. He allegedly got into a fight with Jodeci lead singer Casey and ended up taking a liquor bottle to the head that he says left a permanent scar over his eye. Ah, oh, Stevie. All right, so all of them was in the studio, you know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? He walk in, he's smacking everybody. This is Stevie J we're talking about. So for the sake of the video and any potential lawsuits, we're gonna head and throw the word alleged out there. Other mob members reported Devante being controlling and a little too rowdy at times, sometimes kicking and throwing things around the studio, pushing items over and yelling at them, but was never physically abusive. Some described their time with Devante similar to a college experience and Devante would sometimes treat the gang to mini vacays in order to clear creative blockages. At his young age, Devante played the role of teacher, father, drill sergeant, and handler and became their primary source for income, but sometimes he fell short. Some artists began abandoning ship, signing deals with other labels, and eventually Swing Mob would come to a closure in 1995. Missy and other mob members would create their own collective group and call it the Super Friends, which included the late Aaliyah Hooten, and we all know what happened to them after that. The Basement Era has a lot to unpack and deserves a video all on its own. We'll just leave it at this. As of 2021, people only have good things to say about Devante and Jodeci as a whole. Casey got into a turbulent relationship with Mary J. Blige in the early 90s that would somehow last 12 years. They both claim that the other was abusive and Mary says that Casey once tried to kill her to which he denies. The relationship was emotionally shattering. Things would go from bad to worse after Blige announced their engagement to the public only for Haley to deny they were even involved at the time. Mary further discusses her toxic relationship in her documentary My Life. In an interview with Vibe Magazine, Magazine, this is what Casey had to say. I gave her a ring after she came off tour and she kept hinting around that she wanted a ring. I never agreed to marry Mary J. We never talked about starting a family or anything like that. We were not as serious as people thought. She wanted the world to think that we were living a fairy tale and all of a sudden I ended it. The feelings were never mutual. We would do shows together and afterwards I wanted to hang out with the guys and party and talk to fans. Mary would go crazy. She would come up to my hotel and bang on the door screaming and hollering at the top of her lungs until I came out. Out. She would come up to me at parties and disrespect my company. I had to be careful because if she saw me with a woman, she would try to start fights and put on a big show. It was crazy. Jodeci were living their best lives despite all the rumors that had been circulating around. Parties, alcohol, girls, you all know the rock star formula. The DeGrade parents weren't pleased about their young son's career or the choices they were making. On July 23rd, three-fourths of the group were celebrating Delvin's 23rd birthday while working on their follow-up album. They noticed Devante's absence from the festivities but didn't think much of it. After calling his phone without an answer, they'd been alerted that Devante had been the victim of a brutal robbery where he was found tied up and badly beaten. He'd been robbed of $160,000 worth of jewelry and clothes. In his Vibe interview, he recalls the incident. They had a gun in my mouth and one to the back of my head, he says easily. Talking about, kill him. I sleep lighter now. She made me want to F up a ninja. I'm in trouble for guns, but you won't catch me not packing. It was at first it happened on my birthday. Okay. And uh, we didn't know anything about it. We... Jodeci's second album, Diary of a Mad Band, was released at the end of 1993 with some members of Swing Mob being listed as writers and features. The album skyrocketed to number one and produced the hits Feenin, My Heart Belongs to You, and one of their biggest hits to date, Cry For You. <laughs> The song was such a huge success that even Disney got in on the action, allowing a young Justin Timberlake and Ryan Gosling to perform it on its 1996 comedy sketch series, The Mickey Mouse Club. The R&B rock stars were not slowing down anytime soon. During the 1994 Billboard Music Awards, they met Death Row Records CEO Sugar Knight, who had already taken a liking to them. He'd become a mentor and eventually their manager after the group realized their contract with Uptown wasn't giving what it was supposed to have. Gave. And it wasn't adding up. Yeah. So we started asking questions, you know, and 
Nobody was giving it. They'd began handing out with the death row click, and Devante would produce and write for Tupac's All Eyes On Me album. Diddy wasn't happy about this due to petty beef involving him and Suge, which is, as you may have guessed, resulted into the East Coast versus West Coast beef. Due to their alliance with death row, Diddy would try and sabotage Jodeci's career by not actively promoting their next two albums and had encouraged Mary J. Blige, also an uptown artist, to sing hate songs about Casey to make the public turn against him. We must Shook, I want to say around the billboard. The show, The After Party, The Hotel, came about in July of 1995 and reached the second spot on the Billboard 200, making it the group's highest peaking release to date. It includes the hit Freakin' You. The group would later go on a hiatus in 1996. During this off time, Devante would write and produce for artists over the years, ranging from Mariah Carey to Michael Jackson. He also would urge for Casey and Jojo to create their own duet group. That same year, Casey and Jojo would be featured in Tupac's hit song, How Do You Want It? Casey and Jojo released their debut album Love Always in 1997 and features their biggest hit to date, All My Life. The song stayed number one on the Billboard Hot 100 for three weeks and was even nominated for a Grammy. In 2001, Casey had been charged with 24 counts of lewd conduct and indecent exposure following an incident during the December 16, 2000 Jingle Ball concert in LA. Probably drunk off the henny, the singer exposed his genitals twice to the crowd of over 4,000 people. Drunken performances would become a norm for the duet and their fans kind of expected it. And you say loyalty? Over the years, that duo have made numerous guest appearances on reality TV shows and in 2010 created their own reality TV series, Casey and Jojo Come Clean, which further dibbles into their relationship with alcohol and each other. Casey is the father of three and married his longtime girlfriend Cassandra Chestnut back in 2017. His son Devin Haley is also in the industry. Casey suffered a stroke back in 2018 and is now trying to turn his health around and in 2020 he got back to his gospel roots and put out a newly recorded rendition of his song Jesus Saves. Jojo had dipped in and out of rehab, his last visit being in 2013. He released his first solo song special in 2020 and started his own record label JT Entertainment with his wife Toshanda along with their kids and nephew Devon and they're all included in the roster. You can catch his daughter Sequoia on WeTV's Growing Up Hip Hop. Pretty Boy Dalvin had also been doing big things, working with artists such as Tupac, Mariah Carey, Wu-Tang Clan and Bobby Brown. He caught his first big solo break in 1999 when he signed with Madonna's label Maverick Records after hearing his work on Bobby Brown's album. He released his debut solo album, Metamorphic in the year 2000 and had begun working on his follow-up album Metamorphic 2 with appearances by Method Man, Red Man and Ludacris. But due to label disputes, it was never released. Back in 2015, he shocked fans when he introduced his daughter to the world via Instagram after alluding to the fact that he didn't have any children during a breakfast club interview. Guess it was one of those not hiding the kid from the world but hiding the world from the kid situations. Back in 2020, he released a few more solo songs and as of 2021, is currently working on another solo album. From the looks of his IG page, he's still as stylish as ever. Now for the question of the evening, where in the world is Devante? Well, he's still producing for artists, the latest being Bryson Tiller and Jodeci's latest album back in 2015. Dating-wise, around 1994, Devante had been linked to artists like Pink during her biracial phase and Madonna. Yep, you heard that right. It's no secret Madonna had an addiction to high doses of melanin back in her heydays, if you get my drift. He also got a huge tattoo tatted on his face sometime around 1998, before it it was trendy. Devante has kept a low profile over the years and getting an interview from him is like finding a needle in a haystack. In an interview with The Breakfast Club, Delvin had stated that Devante had developed a fear of flying and that he takes tour buses and cars everywhere, reason being why he rarely appears in anything Jodeci related nowadays. In 2010, Devante was caught on surveillance cameras at a subway in California and was later seen being escorted out by LAPD for public intoxication. In the late 80s, he had two kids that no one knew about till later on and allegedly
allegedly had another daughter with someone named Arlene. They were raised by their grandparents and his son Justin has followed in his dad's footsteps. In 2019, his daughter Diana revealed via Instagram that she had been stripping and felt forced into the profession due to homelessness. I can feel your side eyes through the screen. But wait, before you all go pointing fingers at Daddy Devante, she does seem to take full accountability and often praises her father and often talks about her love for him. We love to see it. In 2010, Devante was caught on surveillance cameras at a subway in California, tackling his group along with his collective swing mob, all whilst being a main writer, producer and director is not an easy task, especially for a young 20-something, but he made it work and is currently enjoying the flowers of his labour. Jodeci linked up at the 2014 Soul Train Awards to prepare for their up-and-coming fourth studio album, The Past, The Present, The Future, and will be their first performance as a foursome in nearly two decades. The official Jodeci YouTube account showcases behind the scenes content leading up to the big reunion. The Past, The Present, The Future was released in 2015 and would be the group's first album in 20 years. Swing Mob alumni Timberland is credited as a producer and it debuted at number two on the US Billboard R&B Albums chart. The official lead singer Every Moment was released on January 28, 2015. As of 2021, everyone seems to be doing their own thing and they're all still highly supportive of each other. Devante now owns his own ranch. All four members have confirmed that Jodeci have not nor will ever split up and constantly reminds fans that they're a tight family. From the baby making bops, amazing stage performances and well put together production, Jodeci once took the world by storm. They gave us trend setting fashion and would end up becoming the standard that evolved music today as we know it. They took R&B and added a little razzle dazzle which set off a chain reaction around the globe. Their influence can still be heard today. Back then but how about now? Cause I'm up right now. And you suck right now. Talks of a Jodeci biopic has been buzzing around for some time now. Mr. Dalvin insists that it's on the way and well, we'll just have to take his word on it, fingers crossed. Were you a Jodeci fan back in the day? Let us know down below in the comments.